Thank you, Susie. And thank you all for coming out. Um, what a great topic. And it's good to see such an um, interested group here uh, that I hope has lots of hard questions for Dr. Fever towards the end. But we're here to celebrate probably the most anticipated book that I can think of in the field of civil military relations in quite some time. Um, a book that's had um, a long genesis and has been, been uh, something you've been thinking of for quite some time. And I thought maybe we could start off with what was the genesis for this? This hasn't been something you came to in the past year or two. What, start, what was the motivation for the project? Well, thank you, uh, Heidi. And it, it is a great honor to be on a panel with Heidi, who is uh, a prolific scholar on her own right, one of the most important voices. She's uh, a specialist in explaining to me how I don't understand the younger generation and the younger generation's use of social media. So uh, she's right about that and so many other things. Uh, she's also diplomatic. When she said long anticipated, that means it took a long, long time for this to get uh, written. Um, and the genesis of it is the fact that about 25 years ago, I led a project with Dick Cohn on the, the gap between the military and American society, one chapter of which was uh, written by me and Paul Gronke looking at public confidence in the military in the 90s. And if you tracked public confidence in the military, it went from sky high immediately after Desert Storm and then steadily declined. And we wrote this book using all sorts of um, analytic uh, chapter analytic techniques to argue confidence was brittle and likely to go down and if you plot on the graph when we published that article and then track public confidence afterwards public confidence soared immediately afterwards and for the next two decades public confidence in the military remained very high and so about five years ago uh, Jim Golby, another great scholar working in this area, he and I said, let's do a study figuring out why I was wrong. Uh, and that was that produced two large surveys and eventually produced this book. And the great irony, of course, is that the book, this book concludes with the same argument that the last uh, chapter concluded with, that only we got a new, t a new spin. It's high but hollow. And so I predict that 20 years from now, you'll do a study that shows fever was wrong again. Why? And uh, and that's how political science advances. So, well, it's it's a, a good point to start with, because I think uh, when we look at the post 9-11 era, the past 20 plus years, we've become accustomed to being pretty high. And when we look back, we realize maybe this has been an anomaly. If you look back at the 1980s, especially in the the era of the big Reagan defense buildup confidence if you look at uh, Gallup or GSS was in the mid 30s to 40s throughout the 1980s so would you say that the 9/11 the post 9/11 era in in the broader american historical experience is an anomaly i think so we only have gallup data back to uh, shortly after the vietnam war and if you look at the shortly after the vietnam war my take was it's actually higher than I expected after Vietnam. I would have thought it would be in the teens or something. Uh, and it wasn't that low. So maybe Nixon was right about a silent majority that kind of, uh, and I th think it was also a, the left, the hangover of the greatest generation who had served and had confidence in the military in the abstract, although concerns about Vietnam War. But anyway, it was low compared to what it is today. And then it's gone uh, up since then. However, the, if you look at the larger sweep of American history, where we don't have good polling data, but we do know from historians what the public attitudes and perspectives likely were, you see a, a slightly different pattern. The American way over 250 years or so is to love the citizen soldier, the one who answers the bugle's call, runs to meet the threat, and then goes back to the farm afterwards. And the Americans shower on that, the whatever benefits they can, the whole entitlement bureaucracy was invented in part after the Civil War to repay the soldiers who answered the call to fight in the Union, and of course, the GI Bill after World War II. But the professional military, the folks who were maintaining the military throughout, the public held them with much lower esteem, some skepticism. 
and uh, go back and watch some of the old sitcoms like uh, Sergeant Bilko. There's, I'm, I think there's only two people in the room who know that. I'm looking at them here, but this captures a, a just a sarcastic, a cynical look at the idiocies of the professional military. And so I do think there's something like of that in the American psyche until the last um, 20, 30 years, I would say really post-Cold War, so from Desert Storm on, a view that the American people now have high confidence in the professional military, the the permanent, if you will, or the longstanding peacetime military until very, very recently. And, and I do think it's hollow and maybe heading down. I imagine we'll get into that. So for, for those who haven't yet read the book, um, but I know who will buy copies right after because Peter will shake you down uh, if you don't. More concerned that you buy it than that you read it. So just, uh, yeah. I'll give you a little bit of a preview. Um, he finds six major drivers of public confidence today, and he does so in a, in a nice fashion for the reader, um, in an alliterative way uh, to keep it memorable. It's performance. It's patriotism. It's professional ethics, personal contact, partisanship, and peer pressure. And the tagline for, for the book is that uh, public confidence in the military in the post 9/11 has been 9/11 era has been high but hollow, high but hollow. So I wonder if you can expand a little bit on the hollowness. Well, first a shout out to a Duke undergrad who helped me come up with that phrase. So we're teaching uh, with uh, General Dempsey the uh, the course on American civil military relations. I made the students read the manuscript, um, and you know I said I can't say that public confidence is brittle, which is what I said 20 years ago. I have to say something different. And uh, Jonathan Griffin said, well, I think what you're saying is it's high but hollow. And I love that because the hollow military is a phrase that resonates with military historians because that's what the Ar what the army chief said the army had become in the wake of, of Vietnam. And so it's a, it's a term that alarms and captures the ear of military professionals. But what I mean by that is two things. One is that if you look at the first five drivers that you mentioned of the, the correlates of uh, high confidence in the military, they're all likely to go down. So the patriotism one is a war frame that we're, you, you the Americans rally to the military and have confidence in the military because we were at war. And that's what happened after Desert Storm. That's what happened after 9-11. Immediately, there was a spike in confidence before the military had a chance to do anything. After 9-11, there was a spike. So that is understandable. Well, are we in that same war frame in 2023? No, we're in something different. We face great power threat. We certainly have a need for a strong military, but we don't have 150,000 troops in harm's way in Iraq getting shot at. And I think that patriotism frame is different, likely to go down. And I can go on each one of those if you want, but the one that is inexorable is personal contact. That we're, we've seen the passing for the most part of the greatest generation, the World War II generation. The draft era generation is is now slowly passing. And we're each cohort is left with the veterans of a smaller and smaller cohort. And over time, there's just going to be fewer veterans, fewer families of veterans, fewer people whose dads, uncles, aunts uh, served. And so fewer people who have that personal connection. And since we know that if you, you're a veteran, you have higher confidence. If you're a family member, you have higher confidence. If you, if you have friends who are in the military, higher confidence, all of those personal connections are going down. So the first sign that it's likely to go down is that. The second is this uh, per, um, uh, sort of peer pressure, the idea of social desirability bias. And I don't know if you want to go into that now or you want to wait on that one, but yeah, go, let's let's talk because to me this is the one that I find most fascinating. Yeah, and it's I think it's correlated with partisanship to a degree as well. At least when you look at um, who is most susceptible yes. to this peer pressure. So right. first for the for the audience, social desirability bias is just a fancy term that political scientists like to use um, that that finds that in survey research respondents may conceal their true preferences from time to time and provide what they perceive to be the socially acceptable or normatively um, correct response 
And we see this in public confidence. So maybe you can expand a little bit on what surprised you most from that. Right. Well, and I also like this is there's not a lot of clickbait in the book, but this is the one clickbait uh, place because I'm I'm allowed in this chapter to link to um, curb your enthusiasm. So Larry David has this great uh, skit where they're at a dinner party and uh, one of the daughters of the host brings her date who happens to be in the military and they go around the room and they go, bro, thanks for your service, man. You're a hero. You know, they go one like this. And then it goes to Larry David. He goes, Hey, how are you? He doesn't say thanks for your service. And it causes this paralysis. The, the, uh, vet, the uh, military officer guest is so undone by this. He leaves the party ends in disaster and, uh, and Larry is kicked out. And as he's leaving, he says, thanks for the dinner. Thank you for opening the door. Thank you. You know, it just it's a it's just a great moment. But it captures the idea that this expression, thanks for your service, especially if it's in the airport or something like that, is almost performative. It feels like you have to say it. And if you don't say it after someone ad admits they're in the service, that you are somehow disrespecting the military. And of course, that's the idea that social desirability bias is tapping into. The idea that People know what's the correct answer, and they're going to give that if they're asked it in a survey. And uh, survey experts have come up with a technique to, to uncover this and to tap into what might be the actual latent attitudes. It, interestingly, it was developed to uh, tap to measure racism, uh, where over the 70s and 80s, it became no longer acceptable to give a racist answer on a survey, but that didn't mean that racism was leaving the population as fast as it was leaving the polls. And it turns out, yeah, if you use these techniques, you can find out that there's more racism out there still in the population, but they're just not going to answer it in a flat question. Well, using those same techniques, you can track uh, how many people are saying they have confidence in the military, but maybe really don't. And uh, this, what surprised me was how large the number those techniques suggested were in the data, anywhere from eight to 27%. And I always use that range because we did it twice. Uh, we did it so-so the first time, and then we got really good advice from uh, you know, the experts. To, and so we did it a second time using it, the more correct, uh, more precise uh, techniques, and we got a higher measure which I thought the opposite would happen, that we get the lower measure when we use more precise measurements. I'm, I'm not sure I believe the higher measure. So that's one of those things I flagged for future work. I hope people replicate that and you know we tap into it. I mean, we measure it more precisely going forward. But I'm now convinced that there really is a certain amount of this uh, of what is reported as confidence in the military is actually just people saying they have it when they don't. Why does that matter? If the permission space for those individuals changes, and so, so one of the groups that shows this is Republicans. If the permission space for Republicans changes because, let's say, Republican elites start attacking the military rather than defending the military, that changes the peer pressure dramatically. And you could see a sharp drop among those people who before felt like they had to say they had confidence, but now they don't have to say why, because, you know, Republican elite, this person, that person I watch on such and such news, they're all telling me it's okay to say I don't have confidence. So I think it could, it could be hollow and sort of collapse more dramatically because of this factor. Or someone else needs to do follow-up research and find that we've mismeasured it I don't know. It's a great uh, project for a grad student. It's an extraordinary percentage if it's the high end when you think about that, right? That 27 percentage points could be yeah, false I, attitudes, right? Too high. I so, can't, I'm not going to hang my hat on that. For number. those yeah. in the military, right, that who have tracked, you know, confidence levels over the past 20 years, um, it's sort of like telling them there's no Santa Claus, right? That, that it's fairly hollow, what are some of the groups that have been more prone to social well, now, desirability bias? Well, the, the Republicans, the one I met, I, I remember, the one that's not as veterans, 
So it was interesting that veterans don't feel pressure to do that. They're revealing their true thoughts. Um, uh, and African Americans not right. You you might have it there. I can't I can't remember uh, on my fingertips. I thought it was tra- you know tip, um, traditional um, groups: liberals, women, Democrats, um, uh, racial minorities were more prone to prop up. But also right? r- also uh, a certain sector of Republicans. So yeah. And so how much of that is also connected to a, a wartime salience? They feel pressured to say yeah. they have confidence in the military when they're fighting two wars. And as that factor's removed, yeah. you know, it that may have as much of an effect as party does in internal dynamics in the Republican party as, as sort of maybe no longer needing that peer pressure. Yeah, I I think so. You can, you can do a self-diagnostic. Do I have this? Do I feel obliged to say thanks for your service if I meet somebody who's in the military? Now, I actually think a lot of that expression is sincere. And those are people who genuinely have been reading the news and recognize that, you know, uh, that uh, this burden has fallen disproportionately on a fraction of the American public. And they want to feel a way to say thank you or at least acknowledge that. So I, I think a lot of it is sincere. But if you feel like guilty, if you don't say it, then that's a sign of peer pressure. Um, and of course, uh, that's also a sign. This is a different. This pushes us in a different direction, but I think it also points to something else uh, that's in the in the results, and that's pedestalization. This is a uh, a new word that I coined. That is loud. It's a new word as of now. Uh, yeah, uh, but it means putting the military on a pedestal, and that's a dangerous place uh, to be. Uh, if you watch White Christmas, like we watch it every year, being you're up on the charger, you could be knocked off, right? So it's a dangerous place to be from that point of view. But if you're on the pedestal, you're looking down on the others. And there's some evidence in the res- survey uh, uh, that this pedestalization factor is uh, taking root. Interestingly, with veterans of the post 9-11 generation, but not the earlier generation. So we we have a lot of veterans in the sample. Veterans from an earlier period have a slightly different reaction to this whole dynamic. And and I speculate that that's because if you served in the 80s, or especially if you served in the 70s and the 60s, then you recognize that the current moment is not the way it's always been and is something precious. And so should be, you know, recognized as precious. If you served in the post 9-11 generation, then your entire time you've been told you're the best, you are the best equipped, best maintained, most capable fighting force in history. You're the best, you're better than all the rest. And at some point, as General Dempsey likes to say, what happens to a profession that has been told for 20 years that they're the best? They begin to think they're better. That's the pedestalization problem. And I, I think also when you look at uh, past generations, service may have been more universal um, and there may have been less of a um, uh, need to kind of separate yourself. And so for, as, as service becomes more unique um, and, and there is less personal contact and we look at 20 years of war, the correlation of, of unequal burden sharing and isolation can feed that pedestalization. There's a statistic that sort of stopped me in my tracks. So the gap matters? Is that what you're saying? Well, this is we we'll, just we'll, come, this to, we'll come to that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Does the gap still matter? Um, but there's one stat that really stopped me in my tracks, um, and it's among the post 9-11 uh, veteran generation that 59% of, of post 9-11 veterans in, in Peter's um, survey thought that those who haven't served in a time of war when, when the United States was at war should feel shame. Yeah. Like that's, that's um, disconcerting, right. Of, of the, probably the most disconcerting finding from the pedestalization chapter, I think. Yes, I, I, I do think so. And because uh, we have an all volunteer force and people have the freedom to choose. And that's part of the American uh, promise is that you have a freedom to choose. Yeah. Of course, the flip side of that is we should recognize those who've chosen this path and make sure that we're caring for them and that we are not abandoning them or misusing them. So it, there's a obligation that goes along with it. But this idea that um, 
that they they are somehow lesser because they did not serve is is problematic and and I worry about that. I, I don't know if that's the worst statistic. The the worst statistic for me was the one that I we spun in a positive direction, but we said only 19% think that military rule would be better in the United States. And I go, well, that's still pretty high. That was, that <laughs> was, and it and I think it was higher for vet, the subsample of yeah. veterans uh, was higher. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I said only 19%. That's really low. That shows strong commitment to democratic values. So, uh, I don't know. 19% is higher than I feel comfortable with. So, yeah. So, Several of your drivers are interrelated, right? The um, the pedestalization. I want to come back and talk about performance, right. which may be somewhat a counterintuitive finding that after twenty years of not decisive results, far from it, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, performance is still a driver of public confidence. But the American public doesn't really hold the military accountable for lost wars. What what are your thoughts on that from from your your findings? Right. So this was actually in the literature even before the uh, the project got well launched. David Burback had a great article where he said, you know, you, logically you would think that performance is driving uh, expectations of I mean uh, expressions of confidence, but how in the world can that be the case given how badly Iraq went, how badly Afghanistan went? So. Uh, we dug into that, and um, our response is twofold. One, that actually the confidence numbers do seem to move if you if you uh, disaggregate and look after major positive news developments, like we captured bin Laden. I mean, I captured Saddam Hussein, killed bin Laden, or major negative performance uh, numbers. Then it it does move in logical directions. So it's not as if the public is blindly um, ignoring developments on the ground. At least that's um, uh, that's what we inf infer from the data. That's good news because a separate project we did with Chris Jelpe and I uh, and, and Jason Reifler made a similar argument about casualties, et cetera. So I do think there's some logical movement is the first thing. But the second thing that's going on, which is uh, what, what you were pointing to, is a partisan blame game, which actually is more problematic. Because when you dig into and ask people, assess how you think the war in Iraq, I mean, Afghanistan went, uh, and then you give them various choices to choose between credit for good outcomes, blame for bad outcomes. And then you also ask them, you know, what about uh, senior civilian officials, senior political leaders, senior military leaders, and you, you go down uh, and give them various options. So more choices than the typical Gallup poll question would ask. What emerges is the following. Democratic respondents in the survey believe that the Democratic political leaders and the military did really well, and Republican leaders screwed up the war. Republican respondents believe Republican civilian leaders and the military did really well, and Democratic leaders screwed up the war. So in you get the partisan blame game, which is expected, right? They, but the military gets to hide behind the partisan. It can play like a hide the pee movement, which then has the military uh, avoiding potentially uh, some serious accountability and after action review. So we need, after the Vietnam War, there was some very painful self-assessments done in the military about what went right, what went wrong. And the same thing needs to be done after Afghanistan. There has been some, but it's been uh, truncated by a variety of factors. And one of those factors might be that there's a part, the pressure to do so is less than you might think because the military can hide behind this partisan blame game. I, I, I think I'd push back on you on one point in that I don't know that the institutional military did a massive reckoning after the Vietnam War. I, I think I, insurgents a, I, did, right? Insurgents yeah. within the military did, fair right? Enough. That's a fair criticism. But there was a pretty yeah. you know, systematic burying of that. That I, There's a parallel yeah, to that, this right now. That That is a, a friendly amendment. I stand corrected. Yes. But you, you talked about party, and so we should talk about the elephant in the room. No, no pun intended, right? But yeah. how, how That's is... That's a good joke I should have used in the... I give it to you. Yes. Uh, 
how should we think about partisanship and public confidence? What's not new and what's new today? Well, even before the book uh, came out, we knew that the aggregate reporting on public high public confidence in the military was masking an underlying important partisan gap. So if you go back 30 years, yes, public confidence in the military is high uh, in the aggregate, but that's because it became increasingly super high among Republicans to the 80, high 80, 90 percent levels and just ordinarily high among the Democrats, maybe 50 percent. So still in average high, but that's a 40 point partisan gap. That's a pretty serious partisan gap. So one of the things that happened over the last 30 years is that at least when it came to measuring affect for the military, it became a partisan identity issue. If you were a Republican, that meant you loved or said you loved and had high confidence in the military and vice versa. Uh, if you said you had high confidence in the military, chances are you could predict that you're a Republican. Uh, and that, uh, you might say, well, that's progress. The Democrats saying high is progress over you know, where it might've been, say, in the end of the Vietnam War or something like that. We don't have good data from that period, but it's easy to speculate that Democrats had lost a lot of confidence in the Vietnam in the military by the end of the Vietnam War. So at least the things improved with Democrats. Maybe that's one of the takeaways. But one of the things that that did is that left the military exposed for a change in attitude among Republicans. And over the last several years, since the data for the book closed, but not since the publication of the book, when the frustrations of that so were to infer a lot. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Subsequent polls showed a drop. Uh, and I'm so glad that the book, book didn't predict that this is going to stay high for the future, for, forever, because that would have been rebutted before we even got it out the door. But um, the, it has dropped for in ways that are consistent with the logic of the book, and it's dropped most markedly among Republicans. And I think that is an evidence of some of the, the dynamics that we talked about earlier. It also raises, you know, troubling questions about how partisanship, which is one of the main drivers of American political thought across any issue, so military, anything, it's distressing that that factor is so important, even on a matter like national security, about which there's this belief and hope that it should be bipartisan, that there should be a uh, views that transcend party, and at least the data seem to suggest that Republican uh, versus Democrat uh, concerns uh, are widespread, profound, uh, and you know stubbornly persistent across a wide range of attitudes in the book. I think in in your chapter you describe the first chapter you describe um, high confidence in the military as uncertain and impermanent. So. If we're to uh, believe right now that this era of affective partisanship is so strong, um, in 2024, if a Republican wins, do you, do you anticipate confidence among Republicans to go back up, that it is hinged right now on that there's a Democratic commander in chief, and then we should anticipate Democratic confidence? Are we just in, in, in for a seesaw? as long as polarization remains as strong as it is? Well, one of the things that changed, uh, that's what I would have expected uh, if a uh, a regular Republican were to win. Well, one of the really dramatic developments in the civil mill space uh, for the nerds like you and me who, who follow this very closely was a change that President Trump made around mid-September 2020, when he was so frustrated with General Milley, but also criticisms that he was hearing in the press uh, from uh, General, um, well, Secretary Mattis and um, John Kelly, uh, his former chief of staff. So very prominent retired generals who reporters were loving to get a negative quote about Trump about. And it 
was angering and triggering uh, President Trump. And he came out and lambasted the senior military uh, to include the sort of general and flag officer ranks more generally and said, they don't like me because they just like to go to wars to make money in arms sales. Uh, it's the rank and file that like me. And so driving a wedge between the senior military and the rank and file with an argument that is, has a lot of resonance in American history, this is what the left <laughs> said uh, and the very, very far left and the very, very far right said in the 20s and 30s um, against uh, the the military, but was not the argument that a Republican had made, you know, not since, uh, not for decades. Um, and so that created a space for a different kind of dynamic where the Republicans would say, well, we don't have confidence in the military leadership. We, some Republicans, we have confidence in the rank and file, but not in the military leadership. And that, so you say, what would happen in 24? Well, in Trump 2.0, uh, will that division between the military leadership and the rank and file persist? Will he? Will it be exacerbated Several of his advisors have said they plan to fire all of the general flag officers and replace them with, you know, 06s, maybe call you out of retirement, sure. they promote you. Um, and if that happened, then the, you know, the churn and the, the turmoil and the um, views, it's hard to predict what would happen to public confidence. I will, I will predict this. The last thing we'll be worried about is what happens to that Gallup figure? Because <laughs> the policy consequences of such a move would far outweigh any importance of a you know a single poll number. So I I used to think that um, <clears throat> Trump's attacks on senior leaders in the military was meant to do that divide to say the rank and file love me and it's these generals that I've picked have turned out to be you know losers and so forth. But since he left office. A number of members of Congress, not just in the House, in, in, in the House, in the Senate too, have picked up that mantle and are not just attacking senior leaders, but individual rank and file service members, um, women, LGBTQ. So, how do you look at this? It's not simply meant to um, divide the military into the senior leaders are a mess and I'm going to replace them all. But it's also saying there's a part of the military that I like and a part that's horribly damaged. Well, here I think it moves beyond just public opinion to civil norms and even, I would say, effective civilian control. Uh, so this is the other civil hat that I wear uh, in not just in public attitudes, but also how the senior military leadership can properly deal with civilian control. And I think it's pernicious because we in this country depend on the senior military leaders agreeing that no matter what their personal views are, they will implement the lawful orders of the commander in chief, even if the lawful orders of commander in chief B is undo what commander in chief A did. Uh, as long as it's lawful, we expect the the military to do that. And if commander in chief C, so at, we get A says one policy, B comes and says change it all, and then C comes and says change it all back we are counting on the senior military leadership to implement that. And I believe with that they would. Would they do so joyfully? No. Would they do so quietly? Probably not. And they shouldn't. They should be advising within the chain of command as to here's the consequences of doing that, ma'am, sir. Are you sure you thought about this, this, this? Do you know when you're asking for this, you're going to get this, this, this? So all of that is acceptable uh, military advice within civilian control. But what we're experiencing today is something different. We've made the military combatants in the culture war. And so one of my quixotic efforts is to reestablish a norm that says we're going to give our military non-combatant immunity in the culture wars. That means we're not going to target them we're not going to shoot at them. We're not going to hold them hostage to achieve another outcome, however valid that outcome might be in a policy sense. 
but we're not going to hold them hostage. We're also not going to hide behind the military and ask the military to carry political water and defend controversial policies when it should be civilians, political appointees doing that. And then the third piece of this is we've got to get the military to talk about their values uh, in a way that doesn't make them sound like culture warriors. And I want to credit you for that third. I already came up on my own with the first two. And then you pointed out, yeah, but how does the military defend its values? And I thought, yeah, they got to be able to defend their values. But there's a way to do so without sounding like a culture warrior. Uh, and so using terms and language that uh, triggers because it no longer means what it uh, what it once meant, that will inadvertently make the military a combatant in the culture war. So the military needs to learn how to talk without becoming combatants. Unfortunately, though, what you're seeing is uh, the opposite, that it um, feels more like a free fire zone. I will say this, this is where I'm more hopeful. I know you're less hopeful. I'm more naive, you're more uh, seasoned. When I, uh, when I talk to my friends uh, uh, on the you know Republican side to include people who are making these arguments, and I make, I say, don't you think this norm is important? And then I go to my friends in the Biden administration to include people who would kind of like to get the military out there to defend the policy because they're more credible than the Biden people. Both sides nod their head and say, you're right, that we got to get that norm established as a good norm. Then each side says, yeah, the other side has been the one who broke it. And, you know, until they fix it, we're not going to. But at least there's a recognition that the norm is a good one for uh, preserving something precious that we have, which is a military that does stay out for the most part of partisan politics, that wants to stay out of partisan politics and is willing to chew their tongue and implement a lawful but awful order in the next time around. And we need to preserve that as a country. If we were, and maybe this is, uh, I'll finish, finish this peroration with this. If we were in peacetime with no external threat, then we could afford to play games like this. Uh, but we're not. We face a serious external threat. Uh, we we need a military that is capable. We have a financial debt crisis in the United States that makes it hard to spend what needs to be spent on defense, in my judgment. So we have to be smart. We can't be reckless. And I, my fear is that we have gotten sidetracked and are reckless with this aspect of civil uh, military relations, which is precious. Sermon over. Back to you. No, so it, it, it's a point well taken. I, I think where I am um, more pessimistic, it's just that uh, norm erosion is hard to reverse. Um, and I think what you find in the book is norm erosion among the American public. You've said that uh, they have a horribly distorted view of civil military norms. Uh, they equate nonpartisanship among in the military with being my co-partisan, sharing my partisan views. Um, civilian elected leaders have not taken, Senator Tupperville has not gotten your message, right, about... Um, uh, not using the military not as yet. a tool. Not yet. So you're hopeful. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I know that members of the Republican caucus, uh, like Senator McConnell, the leader, think this is a mistake. McConnell said this is not the right way to deal with this, even if, as McConnell does, agrees with Senator Tuberville on the underlying policy dispute, says this is not the way. And there are many, many other members of the Republican caucus who agree with Senator McConnell. They have not yet put pressure on uh, Senator Tuberville. Uh, so, uh, but but wait, maybe maybe they will. And that's what I'm, I'm hopeful for. I, I don't see another way out. You can't vote your way out of this standoff by voting, you know, the 300 general and flag officers one by one. There's, there's just not enough time. They're going to have to go back to unanimous consent, um, or else. And when you talk to folks in D.C., they say, "Well, no, we're going to be here in January, but it's going to be 700, 800 uh, by that point." And I say that can't be. That's too horrible. We got so that's why I'm, I'm hopeful. It sets a horrible precedent, though. Like once this has been done, regardless of party, right? It can be used as a tool 
um, again and again. Um, I'm conscious of time and I wanna open it up to questions here in a second, but uh, there's two more questions I have for you. One is just on this norm slippage. Yes. Um, and uh, you, you talk in the book about how the public uh, fails to differentiate between those on active duty and those retired or veterans. And so some implications for the 2024 election and the role of retired generals and admirals in the in the endorsement process. Maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the findings about just the knowledgeability of, of famous generals that might make some in the audience weep um, and, and your takeaway for what that means for future endorsement cycles and so forth. Well, the book confirms what was already known and out there in the literature, which is that the public doesn't know a lot about the military. Uh, and in, interestingly, one of the changes just over my professional lifetime has been the rise of public who will say, I don't know, when you ask them questions. In the 90s, they'd at least hazard a guess. But in the, but now, they say, I don't know. And so there's a growing knowledge gap about the military. The, and uh, one of the, ironically, one of the few things they do know is that the public seems to hold the military in high esteem. So that's a social fact that the public correctly knows about the rest of the public, but the rest of it, they don't know much. Uh, and distinctions that matter a lot for me and you or General Dunlap, one of the other great civ mill minds out there. Uh, and as a lawyer, he will say there's an important distinction between retired and active duty. And he's absolutely right. The problem from a polling point of view is that the public, they know that in theory, but they don't observe it in practice because they have a hard time knowing. Charlie's first name is General, even though he's been retired for a while. And so, yeah, <laughs> the Grand Poobah. But the, in fact, the only um, person that the public could uh, correctly identify as retired or active duty was General Powell. So Colin Powell somehow penetrated public Q rating of awareness. Um, but everyone else, including the the chairman at the time, General Dunford, they you know they just didn't know. And so that means that a lot of the norms which say it's okay when you're wearing the uniform he, to do this, but it's not okay when, I mean, it, the opposite. It's not okay when you're wearing uniform, but it is okay when you are, you know what I'm saying. I just said it wrong the second time. <laughs> Active duty are not allowed to speak. Retired are allowed to speak. But when the retired speak and their first name is general or admiral, the public may be hearing that as if these guys are speaking on behalf of the active force. Uh, they might even be the active force, which they're not. Of course, parties play this up, right? So bo and both parties do this. They're equally guilty of this. The Democrats, you know, egregiously in 2016, literally marched the retirees out to a cadence. So it looked like, you know, they were, you know, band of brothers uh, to say Senate uh, Clinton needs to be president. That that was, in my judgment, legal, but uh, not good for creating and reinforcing the norm that. The, we want the military to stay out of partisan politics. And so the the knowledge gap is, is problematic. And increasingly, the public seems to, what they seem to know about the military is either coming from social media. I realize that's where my students get real media. I mean, real news is from social media. So there may be some confusion there. That's not TikTok. Now. I mean, well, maybe it is TikTok, but <laughs> it's, it, it might be short regular news clippings like the podcast of the daily, you know, from New York Times rather than reading the actual thing. It might be something like that. But it's also probably from TV shows and uh, other um, fiction, fictional accounts. And so what used to be the case that you had some grounding because your dad or mom had served, you had kitchen table conversations. That's lost in today's uh, America. And so we've got to close that gap. And, and you know, my naive proposal at the end is reviving civics education, K through 12, reviving the teaching of diplomatic and military history, both in college, but even before college, all of that would be good. I'm so glad that at Duke, we boast some great diplomatic history courses. I wish we had more and more military history courses for the Duke students to take so that um, 
they at least could close the knowledge gap. But if you, of course, if you look broadly across the population, it's a big, big problem. I, I want to um, close with one last question for me on, um, there are multiple audiences for this book, right? There's at least an audience of uh, people who are interested deeply in civil military relations. That's one, right? Uh, That's one person, yes. There's, yes. We, we know them and count, can count them on two hands and have fingers left over. Um, that's one, students of civil military relations. The military is an audience who can benefit from this book. Civilian leaders that we've talked a lot about tonight can benefit from this book. Uh, and lastly, the American public. What do you hope that each of those four audiences take away from this book? Ah, that's a great, that's a great question. So the military, uh, you can't have a conversation with a member of the military that lasts longer than five minutes before they will remind you that the military is held in high esteem and Congress is not. Uh, and that is true. And that remains true even after the decline, right? So the public confidence declined the last three years, still military high relative to other institutions. So the message for the military is don't drink your own bathwater. Uh, and also don't be focused on keeping it high, focus on deservedness. I happen to think that the problem is not public confidence in the military is too high. My concern is public confidence in other institutions is too low. But I want the military to focus on deservedness, on competence, on professional ethics. We didn't talk about that, but but the military should be rightly worried when they have an ethical scandal that they can't get their hands around, sexual assault, sexual harassment in the, in the force. That's a real problem, a real ethical problem that's going to drive down public confidence. They got to get that, their hands around that. And they should focus on that, focus on real accountability for battlefield uh, performance, et cetera, and then leave the rest of it uh, aside. That's the message to the military. The message to the civilian leadership is that uh, you're, you have something precious in the military, in the American professional military that voluntarily subordinates to civilian control and has put up with a lot of craziness that they've seen, not just in the last you know, six years, but over the last 60 years, there's a lot that has been done to the military by civilian um, mistakes and mismanagement. And yet we still have uh, men and women who answer the call and are performing at an extraordinarily high level. That's precious. You are responsible. You're the custodians for that more than you realize. And I think when I talk to military officers, I say, look, the customer rarely is the custodian of ethics, so you have to be. But when I talk to the customer, like members of Congress or the executive branch, get aware of, I tell them, get aware of what you have and, and learn more. So you're not, uh, you're not making uh, rookie mistakes in the civil military sphere. For the American public, <laughs> Uh, it, it's that naive call for more civics education. We, I, I encourage my students to read as much history as they can uh, because you learn a lot. And if you read history uh, deeply enough, you and as civil mill history deeply enough, you come away and realizing we've made it through as a country some pretty dark moments in civil mill. As, as crazy as it is right now, and it is bad, it's not... Uh, as bad as it was in the 30s when the Bonus Army was being attacked by MacArthur on a, on a you know, in cavalry. Um, it, there's previous periods that were worse, and we, uh, we survived. And so uh, we should, that should give us some reason for hope. And that, I guess, is the optimistic note I end on. I, I don't um, uh, fault you for the optimism on the civics bit, but and I don't worry about Duke students in there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're really stressing it. They're not the ones I'm worried about, right? But but can the broader public, can we build that civics education right now? Or do we have to wait until the fever breaks from Different the partisan fever, yeah. politics? Um, uh, I, realistically, I, we probably, the fever, without the A, the fever will have to, to break. But I think we can. We we still should try, and we we shouldn't take uh, for granted 
by uh, and throw up our hands in despair. So that that's I it's naive. It's not the most naive thing in the book. If someone asks me, uh, I'll for in a Q and A, I'll give the most naive one. But I'll 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 leave with that. Uh, a subsan of naivete. Well, I know there are audience members here who will have much harder questions than what I've had for you. So um, I, I open it up to the audience now of questions for Dr. Fever on his new book. Can we go to General Dunlap, please. Thank you. Next question now. Oh. <laughs> Bigger school. Fair, fair points. Thank you. That is the question that I was going to ask. I didn't want to hear it from you directly. So you've done a ton of research on military trends. Thinking about young people going to the military, I just want to hear from you directly about this perspective directly. But what is your perspective on why we're having such issues with young people going to the military? And do you see a path toward changing that? And is that something that I, I was going to make a joke. Binomics will fix it, uh, but that was a joke, and I know I don't agree with that joke. The number one driver of um, recruiting challenges is the civilian labor market. So that's by far and away. If you can only find out one statistic to predict whether the military is having trouble recruiting, ask what is 
the labor shortage or surplus in the civilian market. And when it's a tough market to recruit for any job, then the military has a really hard time. Uh, in part because you can get the same pay and benefits as a civilian, but not all the same hassle that, that Charlie mentioned to include leaving home or uh, to in, include having to move every two years, whether you want to or not. And, uh, and so there's a lot of uh, aspects of military service that don't compete well with the civilian labor market. There's one aspect that does, that's mission and mission focus. And so you'll you'll see the services lean heavily on that. But that's a harder sell when the labor market is so so great. That's the number one factor. Second factor is that the there's still a COVID overhang. So it's hard for recruit rec takes a while to recruit someone into the military. You gotta have a lot of conversations. But the recruiters were not allowed into high schools. High schools weren't allowed into high schools for a period of time. And try recruiting someone into the military over Zoom. It's You can't do that, right? So uh, there's still an overhang that's going to take a while to work its way through. Then there's like bureaucratic, uh, not snafus, but changes that people don't recognize. During the COVID era in particular, the um, use of prescription meds for ADD, ADHD increased uh, markedly. So just the usage increase. At the same time, uh, the military in its wisdom changed its tracking of that. And they went and now are able to track that very carefully. Whereas before, a recruiter could sort of wink and nod and miss the fact that you had used that. And so you'd get a virtual waiver. Uh, nowadays, they can't because it's in your record. And so now you have to get a, a, a formal waiver because you're not allowed to have uh, not be on those prescription drugs and in the, the military. You need a formal waiver to, to get that. So these kinds of things suddenly reduce the pool uh, dramatically uh, and make it hard. Then things like public confidence also matters, but at the second or third tier, and it's shaping the environment of influencers who might say, yeah, I think you should go. You know, the coaches, the uncles, the aunts, who say, yeah, it's a good good call for you. Last thing, and now I'm looking at my young students like you, the military recruitment model is based on a 20-year horizon. And we're they're trying to get, how long were you, did you serve? Uh, 24 years. How long did you serve? Okay, so that they're looking to recruit folks who will stay that long, develop the expertise. I know you're laughing, right? Who, what, what of my students are going to sign up for any job that is expecting them to stay in 20 years, 15 years? So what's the one service that met their recruitment targets this year? The Marines. Their recruitment model is a two-year. And so the short enlistment is what appeals for to you all, more so than long enlistment. And so I think that the military has to change radically the way they think about human capital development, more in and outers, more uh, opportunities to test the waters, come out, and you, these kinds of things, because there's a generational change in the way uh, folks think about long-term service. So that's my and, high hope. And maybe just to follow up there, that, um, you know, the the each of the services are are meeting and surpassing their retention goals. In fact, we talked to earlier today that the Army is no longer giving bonuses for retention because they're having so many people uh, re-enlist, which stands in contrast to the recruiting challenge. There's a narrative, at least among, you know, Republican partisans, that people, the reason why people aren't joining the military is because it's gone woke. So how do you view this with the retention? We have two different stories at play here. So that narrative has penetrated in the sense that uh, the Reagan poll, uh, which I think we mentioned earlier, they capture clearly that partisans, uh, Republicans will believe that the military is woke and believe that that is a big problem for declining confidence, big problem for recruiting. Democrats believe that extremist, right-wing extremism in the military is a big problem and is driving problems in confidence, et cetera, recruiting. So partisans on both sides 
are hearing that message. But when you actually then go and measure how many people who meet the card carrying right wing extremist, you know, check, check all the boxes. The correct number should be zero, right? We don't want Nazis in the military, but it's still a very, very tiny number. So the concern about it is larger than the reality. You want zero, but it's still very, very small. Uh, likewise, I would say the concern about woke policies is great. The evidence of woke policies is not so great. And the evidence that the the that the experience is being in the military is intolerable because of these so-called woke policies is not supported yet by the retention data. The people who should know best whether you know they're being indoctrinated or not are the ones who are staying. And the ones who should know least well, people who haven't yet joined, are the ones who seem to be affected by that. That doesn't mean that every policy is perfect in the military. We can argue about this or that policy. But it does suggest that there's one dynamic working on recruitment and another dynamic working on retention. And the retention numbers gives me confidence to recommend to my students, if it's appropriate for you, join the military. Because people who have served in that way, uh, they see that they're doing something special and they recognize the importance of it and the high retention numbers uh, bear me up. Does that answer? Oh, that you asked the question, yeah. <laughs> yes, right back here. So if there is a problem in civilian society, it will show up in the military and then eventually it'll show up in the veteran population. So whatever the problem is, and suicide is a good example of that, there's a suicide epidemic among civilian in America. And it also then shows up to a certain extent among the military and to a certain extent um, among veterans. The In the military and in, even in the veteran population, we have more levers to influence it. So the same percentage is more problematic because you should be able to provide the care for someone who's in the, the uniform now because you have more control over their their lives and their access to health care, et cetera, et cetera. So the same percentage might be more problematic for the military um, than it is in the civilian world. But the big driver is something society-wide. So everything that's wrong in, a, in the civilian world will show up uh, in the military world at some point. Uh, and that's, that's my reaction to this. What you do see, though, is um, that the American media and maybe to a certain extent the the public are attracted like moths to the flame to two competing narratives where the military is either a broken victim with PTSD and can't be trusted so you don't want to hire them and you just want to pity them uh, or they are superheroes and deserve uh, the Medal of Honor uh, and of course, there are some in both categories, but not nearly as many as the public or the media focus would lead you to believe. And so studies that show um, performance of veterans in civilian job, veterans are great uh, employees. They are very worth hiring, and they don't, in fact, show job performance problems at the rate that you would think from the media you know, depictions of PTSD. Of course, it's a problem for, for some. We need to get care as a society. We owe it to them to care for them, especially if it or originated from combat that we sent them to fight. So they should get the care. I'm not diminishing the problem, but I think the problem in the media or the problem is described as more pervasive in the media than it actually is in the force or in the veteran ranks. Back in the doorway. Okay. Okay. 
as we're transitioning out of that into a great power company, Walter is trying to figure out their role in our substantial system. That's also affecting the health of the company. Walter is kind of still figuring out figuring out how to roll in it. That also affects the I think I think the end of the GWAT uh, may be affecting recruiting on the on the margins in the sense of well, uh, you know there was a mission there. What's the mission today? However, uh, for folks who are inclined to serve, it's not too hard to see what the mission is. Right, the threats are out there and and very visible. I think you're right that the the military as a whole and the services in um, individual services are struggling to find their role and mission in the new great power conflict. Uh, as long-term advertisement, we're gonna have General Fenton here in the spring. He's the head of SOCOM. Think about that SOCOM, which carried the heaviest burden in the war on terror, and you could understand why they were doing so, right? They were kicking down doors and doing counterterrorism kind of stuff. Well, we're gonna ask him, what is your mission when we're going against China? in a you know, future scenario. So the services and the components have to come up with uh, a, a clear role. Marines, as you probably know, have reimagined and re reshaped the force. And everyone said, oh, you're breaking the Marines. Well, the Marines are still making the recruiting and the retention standards. So it hasn't hurt them yet. So I think it's a real policy problem, but I don't think it's much of a factor in recruiting is my view. But that's the kind of good question that a future a grad student should look at because you could probably get collect data on that and find out whether my hypothesis, my speculation is correct. Right here. So throughout the entire you kind of mentioned I've gone on and on and on, haven't I? Yes. I know what you were thinking on this. Some different ways that the parties are kind of seeing things from the point of view of the parties, but also how different generations and their and their interaction with social media bosses shifted. So I don't have good, uh, what political scientists would say, causally identified uh, data to prove that, that it's work, that it's happening the way I speculate that it's happening. So someone else has to collect that data to prove it. But it stands to reason that media distortions about the military will move it in one direction or the other. And that, and I'm not gonna use the word distortions, but media treatments, if they're favorable, can have a dramatic effect. And we do have some data on this, uh, Top Gun. Uh, which uh, if you take the AGS through film class, you will watch twice. Uh, one and two, uh, Top Gun had an impact on recruiting because uh, everybody wants to join the Navy, which is the finest of the services. And But after you see Tom Cruise and what he could do but single-handedly in an F-14, uh, you wanted to join. And so they actually saw a spike uh, in, in the Air Force. In the Air Force, ironically, right. Well, it's the junior service that was piggybacking on the Navy, but the um, but the point stood that this this allowed young, mostly men, but young people to sit in the theater and imagine themselves, and they could see the, a version of themselves, and and they, they joined. So, uh, and I pair that movie. Well, General Dempsey and I pair that movie with Stripes, which is just from four years earlier. And Stripes depicts a totally different vision of the military. The Stripes vision is if you fail at everything, you're so bad you can't even be a taxi driver, you might as well join the army. And within four years, I think it, that's a great snapshot. Uh, Stripes is a great snapshot of the hollow army at its nadir. And Top Gun captures the vision that Reagan had for what the military could become. And so... These kind of movies, I think, uh, and social media and media depictions can can move uh, people. It's why uh, the 
military recruits heavily uh, in sports as well, right? So the, there's a merger between sports, collegiate sports, professional sports, NASCAR, these kinds of venues with, where it, you have an audience that will, for a moment, imagine themselves doing something bigger than them, themselves and joining something that's more important than themselves. Uh, and they get that vision through either media or advertising, et cetera. That's what the all volunteer force, which is not an all volunteer force, it's an all recruited force, meaning they're persuaded to join. That's what they depend on. We can probably take one last question in the back. Thank you. So I was afraid you were going to ask a question about so uh, about causal identification. One of my regrets is that the title of the book is The Causes and Consequences. And I think, man, I could not get that through Stanford. Uh, there's, I have law, strong correlations, but I only in a few places have causally identified uh, the consequences. Okay. Uh, Sounds better than the correlation. Yes, the consequence. I, exactly. I probably couldn't have gotten that title past the editor. Okay. But well, you didn't ask that question. Thank you. Uh, instead, you asked about, uh, I like high confidence in the military. Uh, because, But I like high confidence that's deserved. I like that because one of the correlates with confidence is willingness to spend on national security in peacetime. And unfortunately, the American way of war is to underfund defense. That's not what you would think if you just look at the last 20 years where we have spent at a very, very high level. But if you look at the broad sweep of American history, the Amer it's, there's nothing more American than underfunding defense and then sending the first units into battle when it's necessary, underarmed, underequipped, undertrained. And the most vivid illustration of this is Task Force Smith, which was four or five years after the great greatest generation won World War II and defeated the Japanese and the Nazis. And then six years later, they go to North Korea in the Korean Peninsula, and Task Force Smith gets bloodied and almost beaten off of the peninsula. Why? Because in the interval, we had underfunded. And so I worry about not adequately funding defense and public confidence in the military and public awareness that what goes along with that is public awareness of the need, I think uh, could prop it up. So that's, that's why I like it, but I want it deserved. And so I do not want hollow confidence. I, I want a military that's earned and worthy of that respect that maintains high professional confidence, high professional ethics. So that would be my answer. What's the exact number that it needs to be? I don't know, um, but but higher rather than lower. Yeah. Do you want to follow up? Yeah. Ah. Okay. This. Oh, that's okay. That allows me to make another point that we should have made. One of the downsides is if you have high confidence in the military and low confidence in civilian institutions, then you ask the military to do things that you really should be asking civilian institutions to do, right? It, we have a COVID academic, uh, epidemic, and we're going to ask the military to distribute vaccines. Why? There's nothing military about the distribution of vaccines. Well, if it's a crisis, it can't be handled unless the military is handling it. That's a problem. And so, but that's not a problem with high confidence in the military. That's a problem of low confidence in the other civilian institutions that might be able to meet the need, whether it's securing, uh, you know, proper immigration. I'm not talking about securing the border against enemy tanks, but having proper immigration procedures at the border, that doesn't need to be a military mission. Um, uh, handling uh, civil disturbances, that does not need to be a military. Uh, patrolling uh, guns in our schools, that does not need to be a military. But there's a temptation in American society to say, if there's a problem, then it's got to be the military to fix. And that comes from high confidence in the military, yes, but more perniciously, low confidence in civilians. 
we are out of time, but if there's um, any indication just by the quality of the questions asked here uh, and the interest in, in your book, I think you've got a real future in civil military relations. I hope so. I hope so. I'll keep plugging away for a little while longer. Please, please join me in thanking Dr. Fever for his service. <laughs>